Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Betsy Fisher-Martin and I'm the Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. Uh, welcome to our virtual series tonight, Women on Wednesdays. We are glad you could join us. To those of you new to one of our events, uh, WPI is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU's School of Public Affairs that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic and practical campaign training, and we facilitate research and discussions like this uh, on women in politics. And speaking of research, uh, Tonight, we have a special program um, under the umbrella of our gender on the ballot partnership that we have with the great folks at the nonpartisan Barbara Lee Family Foundation. Um, so at this two year mark of COVID landing right now in the middle of, of Women's History Month, um, we wanted to take an in depth look at how the pandemic was impacting women voters economically, mentally, politically, and of course, in relation to the workplace. So we uh, teamed up again with our friends at the Benenson Strategy Group um, to put together a real comprehensive poll that seeks to answer many of our questions. Uh, I think you'll find them of interest. Um, a year ago, um, you may recall, we conducted a similar survey. And so the neat thing is that we were able to really get some data this time around and compare it to uh, some of the same questions from a year ago. So we have a little bit of a trend there uh, about attitudes, um, you know, over the past year or so. So the result of um, the new research is entitled uh, The New Normal, Women, the Workplace in Pandemic Politics. And we want to talk about those uh, results tonight. Uh, the lead pollster on our project uh, was Lindsay Vermeyen of Benenson Strategy Group. Um, so we're lucky to have her here with us tonight. She is going to lead us off with an overview of the poll, um, run through um, several different screens of graphics that we've put together, and then we're going to bring in our gender on the ballot partner, Amanda Hunter, who is the executive director of the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, and we're glad she can be here with us as well. Uh, and most importantly, we want to take your questions, um, hear your thoughts on the research, uh, anything you want some clarity on, further information on. We're really here just to have a conversation and engage you uh, and get your thoughts and, and questions. So please feel free during the course of our uh, discussion to type your questions into the Q&A tab you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also upvote other people's questions there that you're interested in as well. And we'll try to get to as many as possible. So with that, uh, Lindsay, I wanna turn it over to you to kind of take us through some of the things that jumped out at us as we looked at a, a lot of the data and cross tabs uh, in the poll. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so as Betsy said, we're going to walk through some of the data from this survey. And then, um, like she mentioned, feel free to drop questions in the chat and we will get to them. To start us off, I uh, just wanted to run through quick specs on the survey. We did about 800 interviews online nationwide uh, a few weeks ago, back in February, with women who are likely to vote in the 2022 election. Uh, the data set does have a margin of error of approximately 3.5%. Um, and we'll go through some of that data with the subgroup. So starting with sort of a lay of the land politically and economically for women this year in 2022. And hopefully for a lot of you, you know, this resonates in your own lives as well. Um, so there are certainly some surprises in here, but I think, I think a lot of these things will, will make sense for your own experiences. Well, the midterm elections certainly don't spark the intensity that we see um, of enthusiasm in presidential election years. 
we do see that three in five women think that this November will be more important than most. Um, you know, after the 2018 election, 15% of women voters said that that election was the most important of their lifetime. Last year, they 51% said 2020 was the most important election of their lifetime. Um, you know, we certainly see 16% this year, so pretty much in line with the 2018, the last midterm election we had, um, but more than half across the board really um, think that this will be a more important election than most. It's really driven by suburban women um, as well as women on both sides of the partisan spectrum. We also see a lot of distrust in our institutions. Um, more than half of Republican women, especially, really lack trust in the information coming from the CDC is one of those really important points I wanna point out. Um, nearly half say that they have not much or not no trust at all in men in elected office. Overall, you know, a third of women lack trust in the CDC, including more than half of Republican women. Even a third of women lack some trust in the Supreme Court. Um, there's just, there's a wide, a wide range of distrust right now. We asked women what the most important issues are for them when they're deciding who to vote for in an election. Um, these are some of the top responses. The economy, COVID-19 certainly remain top issues that influence votes. Uh, but we've also seen in 2022 that inflation and crime have really jumped into the narrative. Uh, the dark red bar here is the 2022 numbers. The lighter red is from last year, 2021. As you can see, COVID has dropped quite a bit. Um, it's still you know, the second biggest issue that um, influences a vote, but it's dropped a lot from last year. Um, whereas inflation has jumped up from nothing to 26 point, uh, percent of women saying it. it's one of the most important issues that they're they're deciding their votes based on. You know, further down the scale, we don't show here because these are just the top responses, but we have smaller numbers for student debt, for abortion, um, for the Supreme Court um, and other issues. Um, healthcare did jump up here this year, 26% of women say it's one of the most important issues deciding their vote. Um, and speaking of healthcare, we also saw that nearly all women told us that the pandemic has showed them we need better healthcare and support systems. Um, that is true across the board, across partisanship, across age, um, across location, geography. And it's even true when we specify to them a healthcare system that includes expanding Medicaid, Medicare, and the Affordable Care Act. Across the board, we're also seeing a much larger sense of doom and gloom on the economy generally. We ask people whether they're feeling optimistic or pessimistic about the economy. Last year, women overall, 48% said that they were feeling pessimistic. This year, it's 59%. Um, more than half are feeling pessimistic about the economy. Um, and that's really driven by older voters um, and suburban voters, especially. And I think unsurprisingly, given you know, what we've seen in terms of inflation and pessimism, women are feeling the effects of the economy in their own pockets, especially for women with lower incomes. Last year, 39% said that since the pandemic began, their personal financial situation has gotten worse. This year, 50% said that their personal situation has gotten worse. So an 11 point jump in one year. Um, among those lower income women, women with uh, incomes under 50K, 55% say that their personal financial situation has gotten worse. Among Latina women, especially 63% say that their financial situation has gotten worse since the pandemic. We also asked women to give us a word or a phrase on an open-ended basis that they would use to describe life in America today. Uh, I think you can tell from this word cloud that it is not it's not great, it's, it's pretty grim. Um, you know, between a lagging pandemic, economic hardship, um, and general you know, stress of balancing work and family, people are, are really hurting. Um, you know, when, when the biggest word here is in trouble, struggle, divided, chaotic, 
These are, these are grim phrases that women were giving us in the research. And compared to 2021, we did see that more women have moved down the ladder in terms of financial comfort. Uh, we asked them sort of where they were in terms of their own finances, if they're feeling very comfortable increasing their wealth, if they're living comfortably and able to save some, they're just making ends meet, but maybe struggling a bit, um, if they're struggling and coming up short or if they're really drowning. Uh, we saw nine points more women saying that they were not living comfortably. They had shifted down that ladder into the into the, the sort of three bottom struggle buckets um, of, of their own financial well-being. All right, moving into COVID's impact on mental health. We do see, and you know, we saw this last year, COVID-19 was and is still draining women's mental health. 58% overall of women say that COVID-19 has affected their mental health a great deal or some. It's comparable to last year at 60%. And this year we're seeing that women who are moms and younger women are really driving this, um, these numbers. 62% of moms say that it's affected their mental health a great deal or some compared to 53% of women who are not moms. 68% of women under 40. Nearly half of women say they're feeling more burned out um, and a plurality say that they're also feeling lonelier too. Um, this is also driven by moms and younger women. 49% overall say that they are feeling much more or a little more burned out than before the pandemic. 48% say they're much more or a little more lonely since the pandemic. 57% of moms of elementary schoolers and 57% of women under 40 are feeling more burned out. And you know, we allude to this in the title of this presentation, but more women are starting to think that life is never going to go back to normal. Uh, you know, 26% last year believe that life will never go back to normal. 40% this year say that life is never going to back going to go back to normal, whatever normal was for them pre-pandemic. All right. Um, diving into caregiving in the pandemic, more than two thirds of moms worry about their kids contracting COVID, yet half say that the quality of life increases when they're in school. We know that people can feel multiple things at once, even if they appear on the surface to be conflicting. 70% uh, say that when their kids are in school, they worry they'll contract COVID. 55% also say that when their kids are in school in person, their quality of life improves significantly. Of course, moms are still happy to have had more time with their kids, and they do want to keep some of those habits that have sort of recentered their own families. Um, you know, we saw similar numbers last year and this year, 84% say that they've loved having so much more time with their kids, even if the pandemic has been stressful. 64% say that they've developed new routines and habits that they hope to keep. But caregiving continues to be lonelier and more isolating than it was pre-pandemic. 53% um, of women with kids say the pandemic has made caring for their children more stressful because they don't have the caregivers that they can go to that they could before. They don't have family or friends or a nanny or babysitter that they can, they can go to right now. 54% say that the pandemic has made caring for their kids a lonelier and more isolating experience. Um, you know, a lot of moms aren't comfortable getting together with other families or they haven't been or, you know, they missed out on that baby group experience when their kid was born in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it's all, it all generates a lot of uh, isolation. Going into the pandemic impact on women in the workforce, uh, caregiving during a pandemic weighs heavily on the ability to perform and advance at work. Um, we've even seen that more women this year have had to pass up opportunities at work. 38% um, you know, say that since the pandemic began, they've had to pass up opportunities or promotions because it would make things even harder than they already are on their kids uh, compared to 34% last year, four point increase. 56% this year say that it's gotten even harder 
to balance caring for their kids with all their other responsibilities compared to 52% last year. More than three in four also believe that there will be long lasting impacts on women in their careers and that the old sort of nine to five work model just doesn't work anymore. 35% uh, uh, agree or say that this represents their feeling very well. The pandemic has made them think the old model is outdated and needs to change. 76% say very or somewhat well. Um, yeah, another three and four say it's gonna have long lasting impacts on their careers, um, even if things go back to normal. CBD, if they go back to normal, according to a lot of women, they won't. Um, and, sorry. Women who've had the flexibility to work from home, thinking about that nine to five model, wanna keep that flexibility. Um, among those, among the 42% who have had the, the privilege to work from home, um, you know, 41% say that working from home is actually less stressful. Another 34% say there's no impact on their level of stress from working from home. When the pandemic is over, um, you know, we see overwhelmingly 47% of plurality say that they'd like to work from home permanently. Um, and an overwhelming majority want at least some flexibility. Interestingly, we do see that kids of moms of younger kids could maybe use a break from being at home. 33% uh, of moms with kids zero to four say they'd like to go back to a job where they work outside of the home compared to just 21% of women overall. All right, switching gears a little bit um, into women in politics. We asked women to think about the number of other women in political office and whether they think there are too many about the right number or not enough. There are too few women in elected office. Three in four Democrats and over half of independent women do wanna see more women in elected office. Um, while a majority of those identifying as Republicans are more satisfied with where we're at right now. 55% believe that there are about the right number of women in elected office. We saw that women of color, both black and Latina are particularly motivated by the goal and symbolism of electing more women. Um, when we asked them whether they believe that the idea of electing more women to political office is exciting and it's time to make history and show the next generation that women can do anything or whether it's exciting, but the, it needs to be the right woman or if it doesn't matter at all. We see that women of color are really driving that, that fight for the symbolism, that fight to show that women can do anything, that women can be in the highest office in land. 34% of black women, 41% of Latino women, uh, just 21% of white women say that. We do see broad agreement from women that more women in office will help them and the country as a whole. 72% uh, agree that women running for political office have a better understanding of the challenges they face in their own lives uh, and know what it would take to help get them ahead. 64% uh, say that if there were more women in political office, it would help us do a better job of dealing with the country's problems. Um, and 62% say that, especially in regards to COVID-19. And then finally, the last point I'll make here before we sort of broaden this discussion, um, while most women do say they're engaged with politics, we have seen that many are becoming more disengaged. Many younger women, many women, especially younger women and women of color have tuned out. 41% overall say that everything going on with the pandemic has made me more disengaged and tuned out from politics than usual. This is a 12 point increase from last year. Uh, after 2020, women were feeling much more engaged, um, feeling like they really had to have a voice, had to make their voice heard in the 2020 election. And we're just seeing not that, we're not seeing that level of engagement now. Um, as I mentioned, this is really driven by younger women, women of color, um, and those moms of younger kids, especially. 56% of moms of zero to four year olds are disengaged, 55% of women under 40, 49% of women of color. 
Um, and those who are less engaged are also, you know, consuming less TV news, um, which is interesting, though they are consuming just as much from social media as those who are more engaged. And I am going to leave it at that and we can open it up. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. That was, I know we went through a lot there. And like I said, be sure to uh, utilize the Q&A. If you have specific questions about the data, we're happy to kind of go back to any screen to clarify anything. Um, you can also find um, most of all, all this deck really on our Gender on the Ballot uh, website. And I know Mayland put in um, the link to that uh, on the chat. So feel free to look at that as well. But I guess, Lindsay, let me just ask you a quick follow-up just even on that last screen where we see this disengagement. Is there, what, what is it that you can point to? Is it, did we go back to the word cloud and think about is just, it's just sort of the negativity that's consuming us? Is that why we were maybe just tuning out and just saying we don't wanna engage anymore? Or like what, what's behind some of that you think? Yeah, I think that is a big part of it. Um, I also think, you know, the fact that we are still in a pandemic coming up on mm -hmm. or just passing the second anniversary after so much engagement in 2020, maybe not seeing the change that they thought they might or that mm -hmm. they wanted to see, um, you know, not having a, a quicker fix for things, seeing that the economy is getting even worse. Uh, I think that's, that's driving a lot of it. In addition to, you know, I think a lot of women were even more engaged than normal um, in 2020. And to some extent, it might not be as sustainable um, for yeah. everyone, but certainly with the, the ongoing stress of the pandemic, there's just only so much bandwidth that women have. Yeah, and I think the Trump component too, right? I mean, I think mobilized a lot of women in 2020, um, but you know, they may not have seen the results that they, you know, that the roses and the flowers did not emerge, right? And so in some ways, um, they may be disengaging a little bit more. That's just kind of, that's sort of my theory, but um, it's really interesting info. Um, I want to bring in our, our partner, Amanda Hunter, um, and get your thoughts, Amanda. I mean, what, what was surprising that there was a lot in this poll that jumped out, but like what to you was the most surprising um, couple of points in the poll? I think for us as an organization that seeks to increase women's representation in politics, the disengagement was the most surprising and the most troubling because we see so many women that are running for office and excited about politics. I also thought the dichotomy of women who thought that the midterms were going to be consequential and the fact that women were disengaging was also surprising and just the lack of trust across the boards in institutions and the fact that people distrusted men in politics the most. We actually found a stat that the same percentage of women across the country are reported to own dogs as say that they distrust <laughs> men in politics. So that is a lot of women, if you look at it that way. Well, and just to pick up on that too, I mean, you all have done in, independently some research at the foundation about, for example, strategies for women incumbents um, who are running again. What you know, what do you think if you're a, a female incumbent running for office again, what do you running for reelection? What do you take away from this information? I think anyone running for office should definitely read this report and realize that women are sounding the alarm on a lot of the cracks in the system. And for incumbents, what we found kind of in line with the cynicism and some of the hopelessness, unfortunately, we saw in this study is that voters don't assume that women are doing an effective job as leaders in office, the same way we found in our research that voters don't assume women are qualified. So women really have to over communicate their accomplishments and remind voters that they're getting things done because voters may not be as tuned in and they're frankly just more cynical and more over it than they might have been a couple of years ago. Yeah, and, and you mentioned sort of like the dichotomy in, in some of these questions. And it was striking to me, Lindsay, and what are your thoughts on this? Is like, on one hand, we see women saying, we want flexibility, right? We want that, you know, this is kind of a new workplace. We want to be able to have flexibility. But on the other hand, we're stressed out. 
so how do you kind of think about squaring that circle? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I think that women have realized they need the flexibility in order to get anywhere close to doing it all. No one is yeah. able to do it all. Um, and I think that they've realized that, especially as society hasn't come through with the support systems that women and families need, that this is the thing that they can get to get as much of it all as they can. Um, I wanted to ask too, um, I don't know, Lindsay, can you, can you pull up that slide 26? Yeah. Um, the one about um, where women have sort of a, there's a broad agreement that more women at an office will help them and the country um, as a whole. And so I just wanted to maybe explore that um, question for a minute with Amanda, because you all have done some really interesting research um, at the beginning of the, in the beginning and middle of the pandemic um, about women leaders in crisis. And I know it wasn't specifically focused on the pandemic, but the timing was such that that um, there was a lot of discussion around that. But just curious on your thoughts um, in relation for this question to sort of women in in leaders and how they've been able to kind of function and ex show leadership really through a crisis. Absolutely. I think one bright spot of this gender on the ballot research is that both political parties are wondering how to engage women voters. And it seems like putting women on the ballot is a good way to do that. We mm -hmm. found in our crisis research, Betsy, that Voters know women are good listeners and not just to experts, which is important to voters, but also to affected populations. And at a moment where you can see in this poll, women feel like no one is hearing them. It's that much more important when you saw all of the women mayors and governors, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, that were reaching out to different populations and using their lived experience to think about how is this impacting mothers that are at home, what school districts don't have enough laptops, some people can't afford broadband, things that might not be obvious to someone who isn't dealing with those same issues or hasn't at, in their lived experience. And I do think that's one reason why in this, in this poll, it was so important to voters that women would be helpful to them in office because of the last two years and how they saw women mm -hmm. lead. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess let's, let me just ask you, um, Lindsay, if you know what else in here really jumped out as you as you, you know, an observer of politics and, um, you know, thinking about what maybe, you know, people running for office should be thinking about how they how they maybe would message to women voters and especially, you know, after the mid after, um, you know, uh, the off year uh, election when we saw in Virginia and that governor's race this communication messaging really focusing on moms and schools and education. Uh, how do you think about, you know, political types interpreting some of this data? Yeah, I mean, I think especially coming out of Virginia, moms, women and moms are a key, really important constituency right now. Um, you know, the fact that certain types of women and certain types of moms are even less engaged than others is, has got to be a wake up call um, for campaigns. It's got to be a wake up call to both reach out to them and to both your points, get women like them on the ballot. Um, you know, I think that just like you don't really know what it's like to be a parent until you have a kid, you're not going to understand what that person's experience, what these families' experiences are if you don't have people like that running the show, if you don't have them in office, if you don't have them uh, making those decisions. Um, in terms of what else was surprising to me, that big jump in the percent who say we're never going back to normal just yeah. is not shocking maybe, but certainly caught me by surprise. Um, it's, you know, it's somewhat of a resignation, um, especially thinking about how pessimistic women are about the economy, 
about how much they're hurting financially and their own situations um, and just how stressed they're feeling um, in their own lives. Yeah. yeah. And I'll add to that. Uh, yeah. um, I think in terms of our research too, for women who are running, if you take this poll, it even drives home more that candidates need to message around what voters are experiencing. Women are really crying out for help on so many fronts. And so if candidates aren't talking about kitchen table issues and relatable issues and also framing their message around the voters, they're not going to be successful. Exactly. One of the most important things that we tell our candidates and our other advocacy clients is that you have to meet people where they're at. You mm -hmm. can't talk about things that are so, you know, a, apart from their lives that they don't affect them. People want to hear about solutions to their problems. They want to hear about, about their future, not your own future. Right. And so much of that, I think, revolves around people's own financial stability and their, and, you know, being able to provide for their family. Um, and, and I think we see that in, you know, just in that issue, the issue question that we did, you know, right off the top, the one on page six, where we, you know, the top issues for women voters and, you know, the economy is right there, um, you know, leading the pack. And, a year ago, as you pointed out, when we went through the slides, right? It was the pandemic. That's less of a factor. And I maybe it's just that kind of like we were talking about that sense of resignation of, um, you know, we've kind of done as much as we can do. Um, we've seen different styles of leadership and nothing is actually incredibly effective. <laughs> Um, but the economy and then this new enter the, you know, the word inflation into our poll, right. Um, that really hits people, um, in the wallet in many respects. Yeah. yeah so do absolutely. you, yeah. So I'm just, you know, I'm curious and sort of when we think about, you know, candidates and their messaging and, you know, the point we had talked about is sort of meeting women where they are at, you know, these, these kind of economic issues are really kind of front and center, but they also, as you pointed out too, really recognize the need that we have to have healthcare has to be there for people as well. Yeah, it seems like for a lot of these programs that we asked about and a lot of the issues in terms of working hours and childcare and all of these sort of structural things, the pandemic was really the hay bale that broke the camel's back, if you will. It was all at once and it just exposed all of these cracks in the system. And I think what was inspiring about our research last year was that it seemed like women were more politically engaged because they were suddenly worrying about healthcare and some of these issues and now They've turned the corner, unfortunately, but it definitely has brought these issues to everyone's front door in a very expedited manner. Yeah, um, we do have a bunch of questions here. So let me try to pull, um, pull a few of these in. Um, let's see. Um, Sydney is asking, um, how can women in the workplace leverage this data for example, the nine to five model being outdated to push for change within their office and with their employers. Um, anybody want to take a stab at that? I mean, it is sort of thinking about kind of the future of the workforce. And also, I think retaining women in their careers and in the workplace. And does this data and does this kind of need for to have this flexibility really speak to, you know, women staying, we've all heard about the great resignation, right? Women staying on career paths. And, if, you know, if you're running a big company, I mean, that has got to be top of mind, right? Absolutely. I think employers should really take notice of this research and especially just looking at how it's affected women's careers. A lot of the statistics that it exposed are things that aren't tracked in the jobs report every month and may not be obvious to folks, but seems like some of the implications that women are facing in terms of 
falling behind in their career or missing out on opportunities could stay with them for at least a decade and really set them back for a long term. Yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of the ways that we measure the economy, Amanda, to your point on the, on the jobs report, that's, those aren't kitchen table issues. You know, the stock market isn't how people are feeling in their own homes, how they're able to pay their bills. Um, you know, the GDP doesn't necessarily reflect whether they're able to afford gas this month or whether they need to make a decision between a prescription and food on the table. Um, I think that certainly like, these are numbers that employers need to pay attention to. And yes, women should be advocating for what they need in order to make their you know, career goals and personal goals happen. Um, you know, that's not to say that like, we don't necessarily have data from this study on whether that changes the 40 hour work week or anything like that. Um, but certainly some degree of flexibility women feel like they need in order to, to accomplish what they have to do every day. Yeah. And there, and there are a lot of discussions right now going on around that specific topic though, is that, you know, if women are opting to have sort of the more flexibility, right, in the workplace, are they then going to be penalized on sort of the career ladder going up if they're the ones sort of maybe going in the office once or twice a week? I mean, what are, you do have some ramifications there that could be gender related, you know, five, 10 years from now. Yeah, I think it's something especially managers need to be aware of. And I, you know, I think hope being integrated into a lot of management training is thinking about the difference in working with remote employees versus yeah. in-person employees and, you know, making sure that there isn't an a, a implicit bias there. I think it's also important for employers and not everybody lives in a dream world where this happens, but for employers to talk to their employees about what they want and what, th what they think will work for them and how they imagine the future of work. Because you see all these articles and all these magazines telling managers what to do, but is anyone actually asking their employees what the employees want or what would make their life a little bit easier? Yeah, somebody was telling me a story the other day about a smaller kind of company and talking about, you know, people coming back to the workplace and what they kind of did a survey of employees and the thing that people were going to miss the most or they were most reluctant to want to come back you know, for full days, for a full week was their pets. <laughs> they were going to miss having, you know, their pets around all of the time. And so, uh, you know, this particular company said, okay, well, we're now going to provide like in, uh, you know, pet daycare, sort of like at the office so that people can bring their pets and have, you know, have access to the pets because it's like at the bottom, at the end of the day, this was like really troubling people. <laughs> so I guess people can kind of come up with their own solutions um, on a lot of that. Um, let's see, here's a question from Christine um, who says, can you comment on women voters in climate action? Um, so I guess maybe Lindsay, like on the question, for example, about the climate came up in um, in that on that page six, kind of all of all of the issues, and we did see that um, there was a little bit of drop off, right? Um, in terms we saw, of we actually saw an increase in the number who said climate. Oh, the increase, yes. Yeah. So yeah. from 13, 13 to eighteen, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, so, and do we know maybe if that is is that younger women. Um, I would I'm guessing, but um, what are your thoughts on that? I think it is driven by younger women, um, but yes, it is. So it is increasingly an important issue, um, and we know from lots of other research that is increasingly important for young yeah. people, especially that they're they are driving um, views on this. And then why do you think, I mean, what is the thinking on why that is, that is maybe more important to women voters now? I mean, I think as we're seeing more and more out of control wildfires in the West, we're seeing giant yeah. storms in the East and the South. I think that climate change has become, is becoming, has become an unavoidable 
part of our everyday lives. Um, and it is something that is affecting people in their pocketbook and at their kitchen table. Um, yeah. So I think, I think as we see climate change having impact on more people, we're going to see it rise in importance. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of people vote based on immediacy of the issues they need addressed, right? Last year it was COVID. COVID, yeah. It's almost always the economy. Um, but as climate change impacts more and more people directly, it's going to climate importance. And the other jump we saw in there too was the issue of crime and safety, right? Yeah, you know, I think the, the GOP has really been pushing a crime and safety narrative um, mm -hmm. in races across the nation. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think we are seeing that in all sorts of races, local, statewide, national, um, that the GOP have really co coalesced around um, a narrative around increased crime, um, you know, in places where that is and is not true. Yeah. Um, let's see, a couple of more questions here. Um, Meredith says, um, does the data suggest that women's civic engagement is down since 2018? Um, and are there party differences? So I guess kind of looking um, at that last question that we showed, right? Um, what do we see there in terms of party, um, in terms of engagement? Yeah, um, let me actually grab those numbers. In terms of party, we are actually seeing more women on um, in the center and on the right, people identify women who identify as independents and Republicans, um, saying that they are uh, less engaged. They are more disengaged. Um, less engaged. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think that that's increased since 2018, Lindsay? It definitely seems like it just from the work that we've done together over the past couple of years. It seemed like there was more of an opportunity last year. And I think in 2018, when at the time a record number of women were running for Congress and elected, we felt like we were really riding a high of women's political engagements at the foundation. Yeah, I think disengagement has increased across the board. And I also think when we think about, there's, you know, the other question that, um, the question on uh, slide 24, uh, Lindsay, about uh, when we think about the number of women in elected office, and I, we saw this very similar number the last time we did the poll, and I remember it was striking to me at the time um, when we asked about the current number of women in political office, you know, whether women thought that there were too many women in elected office, there were about the right number of women or there were too few, we saw a huge party split there with, of course, you know, the vast majority of Democrats saying, you know, there's too few women in elected office. Um, we saw 56% of independents say that, um, but we only saw 29% of Republicans say that with like the majority of them, 55% saying, eh, you know, it's about right. You know, it's not, it's not a huge, doesn't seem to be a huge priority. And that hasn't seemed to change. Is that right? Even though I will say, um, you know, the Republican party did have kind of a banner year in terms of women getting elected to office, right? In, in 2020. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're right. These numbers haven't really changed since last year. Um, independence, you know, we're up just a little bit in terms of the percent who were saying there were too few women in elected office, but Democrats and Republicans are both both consistent um, year over year. And yeah, you know, Republicans, I think, elected more women last cycle than they ever have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're, you know, they have a lot of women candidates on ballots already for this coming cycle. Um, so, you know, I think Republican Party has finally realized that they they can't have a sustainable coalition with just appealing to white men. Yeah, and I would have expected maybe this number just to go up a little bit just to, because of that coming out of 2020 where maybe more Republican women are, 
you know, taking pride in the fact that they have more women or saying we need to have more, but what are your thoughts on that, Amanda? I think that it, it probably is true that Republican women have seen a record number of Republican women elected to Congress and we're kind of celebrating that. Mm -hmm. And also maybe along the lines of what we saw in other data points, maybe women haven't been paying as much attention to it specifically in the last year or so either and just are, aren't as up to date on what the numbers actually are, or maybe yeah. it's not as much of a priority for some folks. Um, it yeah. definitely is. If from our standpoint, there are never enough women in elected office. So we always want these numbers to be higher across the board. Yeah. And I just want to call out, you know, on so this slide that I just pulled up here um, in terms of whether, you know, electing more women is really important or if it doesn't matter, um, if it's more important to have, you know, the right person. Um, this bottom punch here, it doesn't matter to me at all whether we elect more women to political office. 8% of Democratic women say this, 23% of independent women, and 42% of Republican, Republican women say this. Um, so they are consistently, you know, just less concerned about increasing representation in politics. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, do you think that that also comes back to the general attitude that's more prevalent among Republicans that is we don't want identity politics it doesn't matter about the gender or the race of the person it's about their candidacy which when you drill down oftentimes in focus groups that's not the case but it seems like maybe that's where some of that's coming from yeah I agree with that um, I mean just 13 percent of Republican women say that the idea of electing more women is exciting Um, yeah, let me get to a few more questions here. Um, let's see, um, here's a question from Lucy. Um, she said, this is powerful data. In light of this, does anyone have any insight on why it is so difficult to get paid family leave, childcare funding, and other supportive family-friendly policies approved by Congress? Lucy, that might be like a subject of an entire other <laughs> hour, but um, uh, Amanda, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, because this is an area I know that um, Barbara Lee cares very much about, and I know some of the work that you all have done is in this area as well. Definitely. Hi, Lucy. I think that partially it's because of the people who are most affected by this issue tend to be younger women, women of color, women who aren't political donors, that aren't powerful, so there's not as much motivation. I think also framing it as an economic issue is so powerful. One thing we were talking about last week was the fact that in some towns there are fast food restaurants or other places that are closed on certain days now or might have to open later, and, and some of that is driven by childcare challenges that Starbucks has to close at noon because women have to go get their kids from school if they're working. And so maybe if people can't get their Starbucks because of childcare, that could finally be the motivation that could make them get behind paid family leave. It really is a, an economic issue at the end of the day in so many fronts. And we've all heard that recent reports too, just even the skyrocketing, speaking of inflation too, I mean, child care costs are not immune to that. And it's, you know, um, just the cost of child care itself is, is so uh, expensive now. Anything you want to share on that, Lindsay? Um, yeah, I mean, I would just echo that this mm -hmm. comes back to having the people who have the lived experience in office. Uh, you know, we don't have that many yeah. mothers in Congress. Uh, yeah. If we had more mothers in Congress, we would have better family leave, better support systems for mm -hmm. all sorts of families. Well, and that goes, Linda has a point here in the, in the Q&A too, of like some of my students are having a hard time with high gas prices. And she says, I'm not sure many middle-class women understand that. So, I mean, that kind of goes to that, to that same point, right? 
Um, let's see, here's a question from Zach who says, what is next for your research? Uh, were there any questions that you wished you asked or would like to ask in an additional study? Zach, we will invite you to our next call on this very topic <laughs> if you want to share your thoughts. But Amanda, um, was there anything that just 2020 hindsight you think we should have tried to get in here? I know we did a lot, but um, or Lindsay, you think we should have tried to get it get to? Uh, there's never enough time in a survey to get to everything. <laughs> I think it would have been interesting to look at more issues that could potentially galvanize women in the midterms, like reproductive freedom, for example, uh, like voter suppression, some of those things, maybe drill down on that a little bit, um, but we're limited by time and space as we all are. Yeah, but just from a practical standpoint, Lindsay, I just, you know, for people that um, might not be as familiar with sort of the mechanics of polling, could you just give us a little peek in sort of some of the, you know, how the polls are conducted, how long, you know, a typical survey should last, what you have found in terms of responses. I, you don't want to make it, you know, a questionnaire too long or you're not going to get, um, you know, quality responses or what do you just, as a pollster, what are your thoughts on, on some of that behind the scenes stuff? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I mean, this was a 15 minute survey. We generally, you know, sort of max out our surveys at 20 minutes um, because that's you know, a certain point, people become disengaged, you're going to lose a lot of different types of people, they're going to lose people, you know, of, you know, people who are busy, people who have to go work. Um, you're not going to get a, a representative sample if you, you know, have a survey that's too long, or questions that are, you know, worded in a very confusing manner. Um, you know, we don't, we go, we had a lot of questions in here that were addressed to moms, we're not asking those of people who don't have kids. Um, you know, so we together, Betsy, Amanda, and I wrote the survey, you know, we wrote the questions, we sort of figured out the topics we wanted to talk about, to ask women about, um, and then, you know, we, we send out the invitations to the survey online. Um, we had, I, as I mentioned, over 800 women take the survey, um, and, you know, it was about 15 minutes, um, and then on the back end, we, you know, ensure that the sample looks representative of those likely 2022 voters um, so that our, our demographics are in line with what we expect a likely voter universe to look like um, so that we're accurately representing, you know, views of women of color, views of younger women, um, views of, you know, women without college degrees, that sort of thing. And tell us a little bit about, you know, how you find the representative sample and, you know, to, as a sample, you know, of this size, you know, because we're looking you know, specifically at women, you've got to do a lot of outreach on the upfront to kind of find that bigger sample. And we want to have it big enough because we want to be able to look at things like moms, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, I don't think it's a secret that response rates in uh, the polling industry have dropped drastically. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you answer the phone to an unknown number anymore, um, but it could very well be a survey um, that you're not taking, um, or maybe you get an email or maybe you get texted a link to a survey. Um, and so, you know, we send out thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands probably, um, of, of invitations in order to get, you know, a, a big enough sample to look at. You know, response and this sample was online. all, just to clarify, all online, right? Yes, this was all online. Yeah. But, you know, as it, with other projects we work on, we, we use all sorts of uh, modes of contact. Yeah, um, all very fascinating. Um, let's see, here's a question uh, from Jane Hall, Professor Jane Hall. Hi, Jane. Um, she says, do we know if dads want more flexibility or better childcare? Women seem to assume it's women who do the childcare, which is probably true, she says. <laughs> but to the point, we didn't, we didn't um, survey men because we wanted to have this kind of oversample of women, but I guess generally, Lindsay, in the work that you do, um, do you have any thoughts on Jane's question there? Yeah, um, you know, Jane, I did some I did some research last fall, um, you know, around sort of childcare and and um, you know talking about different issues that affect families, um, and you know when we we put a message in front of people that 
didn't directly, but sort of implied that childcare was a women's issue. Uh, a lot of men bristled at that. Um, you know, they said that, you know, this is, this is an uh, issue that affects me just as much as, as the mom in the family. Um, so yes, I think, I think that men need that support too. And I'll also yeah. add, Lindsay, that I think if, even if women end up sort of doing a lot of the emotional labor in a family and taking on a lot of those tasks, it's still an economic <laughs> issue for families when you look at the fact that paying for daycare is similar to the cost of paying for college in some cities, it's affecting the entire family in, mm -hmm. on an economic front. Yeah, I think I saw that in a lot of places, childcare costs more than the mortgage, the average mortgage for most people. Um, okay, well, we're almost out of time. So I guess I would just um, maybe ask Amanda and Lindsay if there's any final thoughts that you have, um, observations, and, um, and then we'll, we'll close it out. Amanda, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you. Thank you. Well, because our founder, Barbara Lee, always likes to focus on the positive, I always try to end on a positive note. So <laughs> I think even though so much of this is so difficult to take in because it's so negative, the fact that women do value electing other women to office and see them as effective leaders is important. And hopefully this will be a wake up call when it comes to policy that affects women's lives. Yeah, and I, I just, you know, somewhat to, to build off of what Amanda said, I think that, mm -hmm. you know, this is really, this just reiterates how much support women need and should have from society um, in order to do all the things that society seems to expect them to be able to do, um, you know, with just magically on their own. Um, I, I really think that this should be a wake up call and you know hopefully we we find a way to get through to you know through partisan gridlock through whatever we need to get through in congress and with our political leaders to make that happen yeah and hopefully next time we do the poll this nasty word cloud um we'll have some better words in it hopefully <laughs> right fingers crossed yeah <laughs> um so thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, we're gonna, we, I do see a question in the chat about a recording and we are recording this and we will um, post this on our website. And it's also on our, um, will be up on our Crowdcast uh, channel probably later tonight. So please um, feel free to share uh, the link and the information with folks. And again, Gender on the Ballot is our partnership with the Barbara Lee Family Foundation. And that's um, sort of our hub of all of this research data. Um, so I invite you to check out, you know, all these terrific slides are there. Uh, there's a press release. There's been a couple of news articles written about the survey. So we encourage you to check that out and feel, feel please feel free to keep a dialogue open with us because you know, as we had that earlier question about next polls, um, we're always thinking about other things to ask and to focus on. So please um, keep an open dialogue with us on that. And uh, Amanda, it's always terrific to work with you. So thank you. And Lindsay, thank you for all of um, your work and your team's work at Benenson. And uh, thanks again for everybody who tuned in. Have a great night.